Donnie, we have a special guest that we're so excited about having with us on the program today. And Holly, it's been quite some time since she's been on the program. So some of you may not have heard her or know about her, but you are going to, you're in for a treat today. You know, school has just started back in for the seven, 2017 and 18 uh, school year. And I thought it would be great to bring this lady back so that we could talk about our public schools and schools, the education that our children are getting. And I could think of no one better than Holly Swanson. And Holly, welcome uh, to Francis and Friends. Thank you so much and good morning to you all. Um, and I know you see the man and I think you heard him introduce you, my son, Donnie. Is over here. Mike Muzzerwall is here, and Jim Nations is here, and they will be taking part in the conversation and uh, so forth and so on. And but we're just so excited to have you and talk with you again, again, Holly. Uh, you're doing a great job. I want to encourage you. Uh, not only is Holly an author and a national speaker, but she is also the founder of We Choose Freedom. Exactly what does that mean, Holly? It, it, it means exactly we choose freedom. If we stand back, we let it go. Or we stand up and we choose to preserve our freedoms, our liberties. And in education, it couldn't be more important to do so for our children. It means that we want to choose freedom and pass the values and the principles of freedom on to our children. If we do not, everything else we do will be for not. That is exactly right. Um, okay, you, as I'm looking here, you seem to be, Holly, and I think you are a leading authority on the hidden agenda of the environmental movement that's taking place in the United States of America. Um, and uh, there's so many layers of propaganda and uh, that reveals, you know, it's hard for me to believe and understand that the schools is so much involved in this environmental education um, and that they're putting in, but yet I sit here and read about it every day. So I know that that is actually happening, but I was praying that with the election, and of course I know it's early, of uh, Donald Trump as president of the United States, uh, because listening to him, uh, speak, he understands the condition that our schools are in. Just two or three days ago, I heard on national television that America is ranked number 30 in all the nations of the world as far as our academic standards and so forth. Um, is that an accurate statement? Now, I have not heard that particular figure, but Given what is happening in our schools, I would think that that would be close to accurate. But, but that's, yes, I haven't heard that. I haven't documented right. that. Right. But you know, panel, I heard to hear that. Right. Here's this nation, and we're, I mean, we are the number one in the world at our educational system and teaching our children reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I'm listening then two nights ago, and they've got a, a professor on that she is stating that we should not be teaching our children the basics of mathematics because that's not fair to the other students in her in the classroom and so she said that you know that every classroom should be more of a social justice classroom oh my. now think exactly. about what we're saying Education is not important anymore, but we, as we know, Holly, that's part of this hidden agenda that is that's taking exactly place right. in the world today. So I'm going to let you give you the platform and let you share with us exactly where do we stand today as far as our educational situ situation. And that I'm talking about uh, kindergarten. I'm talking about elementary. I'm talking about high school. I'm talking about college le levels and so forth. Uh, I'll say, Mercy, what you just said about the math should not be taught because it's unfair to the students in the classroom. And as you stated, it should be a social justice education. This is, this is a huge uh, point in what is happening in our schools. That is the shift in focus 
that the environmental movement has intended to bring about and is bringing about in their plan that has been being implemented carefully, slowly, since the 70s. It began with environmental education, with the idea of reduce and recycle. That's something that sounds very reasonable. Obviously, waste not, want not, something that's a, a common sense approach. However, that was the beginning, and then it has escalated from there. And I believe the important point to make for those who might not understand, the environmental movement is a political movement, which means the agenda the environmental movement is implementing is directly aligned with a political philosophy and a political party. And the environmental movement created an image of nonpartisan, but is in essence and absolutely imposing a partisan agenda that mirrors communism first and Green Party goals second. And essentially, social justice means communism, and I can define that later, but this is how the environmental movement started to shift the focus from academics to survival, to environmental survival, using fear tactics to scare children into compliance, giving away free curriculum to teachers so teachers would start teaching this, and most teachers had no idea that environmental education was advancing a specific political agenda that mirrors communism. And what has happened over the last 40 years, over the last 20 years specifically, since 1990, it has escalated to the point with which you just so accurately pointed out, the focus is not on teaching basic skills and letting children make up their own minds about issues. It is all about changing our children's values to align with the political goals of the environmental movement, teach all our children, take over education, make the environment the central focus. So right now, as you're looking at the end game, is to graduate class after class after class of new voters who are trained, indoctrinated to impose communism in America with their vote and with their activism. And it's, it's totally uh, saturated our public school system at this point. There is a chance to turn it around, absolutely. But that's where we are right now. And it's, it's permeated uh, right now from preschool to uh, high school. It started really pushing this agenda on the college level and that's where we see a lot of the Antifa and the hatred for our country. We have students in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and even early 50s who have been victimized by this indoctrination process, this brainwashing process. And the bottom line is we need to let those individuals heal. We need to concentrate on getting this curriculum, this environmental education, politicized curriculum out of our schools. Okay, we have been uh, discussing this for you and I have, and I've had others on the program exp expressing the same concern. It, have we had done any good? Is it making any headway, standing up to it and trying to make more people aware of it? Absolutely. There is, there's no doubt that the more people understand what the political agenda is of the environmental movement, the more they can see it in the ever-increasing uh, controlling, changing regulations in regard to business, in regard to how churches operate, in regard to private property rights. Once it is out there and the population is understanding it's communism, it becomes clear. It has been buried behind the idea that this is all being done for the environment. That was a deliberate political strategy so that the American people would not be scrutinizing the goals and the calls for change that the environmental movement made and the environmental education mm -hmm. movement made to get into our schools, it wouldn't be scrutinized if it's just nonpartisan because that's supposed to be all. Okay, and Holly, and so actually what is happening, they're using the environmental 
experiments in the school, it's opening the door for outright communism to be caught, taught in the schools. And I've been shocked at some That's of exactly the- what it is. It is teaching communism in our nation's schools. That is not a environmental issue. That is not a academic freedom issue. That is an issue of national security. Teaching communism to our children is an issue of national security, and that's Absolutely. truly how we need to present it. That's it, right. Mike yeah. Muzzerall, you know, was I was, uh, honey, I was looking at your article, Opening the School Door to Communism, and uh, you talked there about second nature, and uh, one of the leading advocates of the Education for S Sustainability Movement, and it talked about their, their objective, says, uh, humans are guided by a whole set of beliefs and values, and those come from culture, from religion, from social, economic, and political structure. We need to change all those. And so the, the goal there is not only changing the social, the political, the, and the environmental, the social, the money, but also changing the church system. And, and what we see today, there's less emphasis on what the Bible says and more on consensus among the people. Mm -hmm. And that's done by using the groups. Right, right. Yeah, a group thing. You know, Holly, just last night, I heard, uh, it, it absolutely shocked me. I stopped and stood still when I heard it because it's been so long since I've heard anything like this. But the news was on and I had just walked into the room and there was a college professor, I, I say college, he was a professor uh, in education and he was on the air and he was stating that America has got to get back to and stop this group think that's taught in our schools and get back to teaching our students. Now, I heard this on the news just yesterday, right. to think for themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely, because what, what, is, what is happening is the students are not only being trained how to respond to a political issue, they're being trained what to think about it. They're being told what to think about it. It is the communist model of education where from the time students enter the school to the time they exit the school, every lesson is to reinforce the philosophy of communism so the students learn to submit, they learn to simply obey, and they do not think for themselves. They operate in exactly what you're talking about, group think. And that's what's destroying this country. And it, go ahead, Donnie. Critical thinking is what led to the foundation of this country. Men who came together, who no longer wanted uh, taxation without representation, but it was their critical thinking right. and looking at yeah. the situation as it was and seeing uh, the oppressiveness of, of, of the, of the uh, king that was ruling the nation and that it was only going to get worse. And so critical thinking, without critical thinking, society cannot function. And, she, and, and, and at the earlier part of the discussion, you brought out math, and I'm not, what, math and science were not my best subjects. Thank the Lord for calculators. But <laughs> most, people don't, most people don't realize without math, the world cannot function. If, 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 you, if you let kids grow up not teaching them math correctly and they can just do whatever they want to do, then just think a minute, building will stop because the buildings won't stand up. The math is wrong. Travel, airplanes, boats, everything is run by math. Right. Everything. Uh, you, you get uh, commerce, as we know it, would cease, built around math. Everything. Um, uh, it would cause the, without critical thinking and without math, not meaning that every person in America is going to be a math whiz, we're not. But those people that are building buildings and planes and all that stuff, they better know math. Well, yeah, but it spills over into every area of life. It's what it is. And actually, you know, I've been saying this for years, and I was actually told, Holly, uh, I had a group of educators on here, and we were talking before the program, and I said, well, this is communism. And they said, but you can't say that. And they gave me another, yeah, they gave me another word to use, 
And I was using, but of course, when I got on the pro program, I still continue to use communism because I, we need to jar the people. This is what is the curriculum is in our schools in the United States of America. Let me talk to you a minute about the state of Oregon. And because I see so much of this coming out of the state of Oregon. And, uh, and I do think this was where um, a lot of the immigrants, when they started bringing them over here and settling them in the United States of America, that was coming from the Middle East and so forth, that they settled them in Oregon, the state of Oregon. Am I right or wrong about that? I don't know the numbers on that exactly, but I do know California and I do know Oregon have uh, opened their doors and there is there is are a tremendous amount of immigrants here as well as California. Mm -hmm. And Oregon is a hub. Uh, our governor years ago, back in around 2009, said that he would like to see Oregon become a basically a model for the nation on the sustainability education. And we're working very closely. Second Nature was working very diligently in Oregon to impose the Second Nature agenda. So a lot of that uh, started here in Oregon. This was a target state. And since then, a lot of the environmental literacy, climate literacy, the resolution passed by the Portland Public Schools that impacts 49,000 students from preschool to high school is all about teaching social justice. It was a resolution passed supposedly on climate change, but that particular resolution not only talked about teaching students to end fossil fuel use, to change our economy, but to also become social justice activists. And it is imperative to understand the meaning of social justice as it is defined by uh, education for sustainability educators, including Second Nature, is that social justice is essentially, uh, let me get see where my notes are here real quickly, but Social justice is achieving, it's the goal to achieve equality in the distribution of goods and wealth among all groups in society. Again, social justice is achieving equality in the distribution of goods and wealth among all groups in society. All right, Holly, I got to go to a quick break, and I'm okay. going to be back because I have some more questions that we want to ask you. Sure. And if you'd like to go to Holly Swatson's website, we will have that on the screen and uh, look under, uh, what is your website listed under? Well, probably the, the best thing to do is to just email us directly with your questions on okay. how we can help you best. But you also have a couple of books and that I want to tell the people about as well. And okay. um, because we'd like for them to get them. I have one on my desk right now, Training for Treason. Uh, but you have another book, and what is it called, Holly? I Set Up and Sold Out. Find out what green really means. Yes. Oh, and I'll tell you, her books are excellent. And if you will get these books and read them, you're going to have a much better understanding of what your children are facing in the schools today and what the parents and the grandparents are facing with their children today. Holly, we'll be right back. Thank you. Email your questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. product from today's guest, Holly Swanson. Call 1-877-715-5481. That's 877-715-5481. Or go to Amazon.com. Viewer supported by people in your community. This is the Sun Life Broadcasting Television Network. As most of you know, Mike Muzzerall is on Francis' program quite often. And we consider Mike to be one of the most noted authorities in the world today on the cults. These are directions, religious directions that are false. I've got in my hand three DVDs. This one is The Truth About Mormonism. You need to know what this particular religion teaches as a child of God. You need to understand it. You need to know it. I think Mike will go into detail to help you understand this as maybe you have not before. This one is a must, ladies and gentlemen. The truth about Islam. The truth about Islam. And he deals with it 
in a clinical way to help you to understand the falsity of that particular religion. And then the truth about Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness. And you need to know what that is also. One of the great problems with many, many believers is that they just don't have the knowledge they ought to have of the Word of God to know when something is wrong. You need this. You need to take advantage of it. Now listen carefully to me. We're cutting the price because I want you to have them. You need them. You need to know what the Bible says about these particular things. And considering that we've cut the price to the bone down to $10 each, I would pray that you would take full advantage. That would be $30 for all three of these. Now, this is Jimmy Swaggart saying, get out your credit card or your debit card and go to that phone right now and place your order. I'll promise you this, you won't be disappointed. Connecting with the Sun Life Broadcasting Network is easy. We're everywhere. We're online and in the air and in your pocket. Wherever you are, watch and listen to your favorite SBN programs while you're on the go. All day, every day. We're going to fail the Lord, but the Lord doesn't kick us to the curb. If you won't quit, He won't quit. No matter what storms may come, God is going to be right there with you. Download the free SBN app today at the iTunes Store and Google Play. Join Francis and Friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Francis Swigert. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. And Holly, let me ask this question. Since President Trump was elected and Betty DeVos has been placed over the educational programs in the United States of America, are we seeing, seeing any change in this? Or is it all still headed in that direction that we've just been speaking about earlier on the program? Right now, uh, the president has taken, and Betsy DeVos uh, is taking, some steps in that direction. However, um, that said, it's still the movement, that train, the environmental movement to push this into the schools is still on a fast track to get the job done. Uh, let me digress just a minute. What President Trump has done in April, uh, he signed an executive order uh, basically enforcing statutory prohibitions on federal control of education, meaning the goal is to give states and local school districts control back of their schools. Now, the whether, whether it be Common Core, it specifically mentions Common Core, in the article that the schools do not mm -hmm. have to do that. However, where the schools, be it in Oregon or Louisiana or Washington State, the schools that are already implementing and have been implementing Common Core will probably continue to do that unless there is a push from the citizens of that state again to get it out of the schools. There was an initial large push nationwide uh, opposing Common Core and then I think people backed off just a little bit because it just seemed to be going forward. Now, with what the president uh, initiated with this executive order, there is an opportunity to change the education system, to take back control. But the people are going to have to step forward and help get that job done. Um, and that's, that's a very positive yeah. thing. And right now, uh, Betsy DeVos is reviewing programs that could be cut, which are influencing, pushing, pressuring, advocating that schools participate in. For example, the Green Ribbon Schools program would be a program that should be cut because the Green Ribbon Schools program is promoting and advocating the agenda of the Education for Sustainability movement, and obviously that includes social justice, and the schools that go along with that have been receiving awards, I think, since uh, 20. 2012, 2013, or 2014. So the, the point I'm making is that there are steps right now. We have some power right now, and that means that the work that we've all been doing to make this an issue has been a tremendous benefit. 
we need to keep pushing as hard as we can right now because the the opposition is not only doubling down they are tripling their effort to get this into schools nationwide the NEA the Earth Day Network their goal is to duplicate the Portland resolution to teach children to be social justice activists in schools nationwide every school to teach this pre-k through high school nationwide that's the goal of the Earth Day Network that's the goal of the National Education Association and where this curriculum targeted states right now uh, that uh, the idea is to, to push this curriculum in those states are Texas, Oklahoma, Alabama, Florida, Indiana, Idaho, uh, Washington, and California. Those are, those are some of the top ones. That doesn't mean that it's not being pushed into schools in Louisiana, into schools in uh, Minnesota. This, this is a, a very um, dangerous uh, agenda because the idea is to slip this resolution in to a school district before parents have any idea it's even in there. Mm -hmm. And what you said, Donnie, is absolutely so true about critical thinking. The idea of the Education for Sustainability movement and behind the auspice of social justice is to diminish the value of individual success. So if you don't learn your math and you don't value any individual success, as you were mentioning, uh, Mike, about the classroom, if you don't value individual success, and what you mentioned about teaching math, uh, Francis, is that the students won't have any reason to learn. Um, why how, bother? Go ahead, Holly. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, why bother? And way back on one of our initial conversations, you mentioned that when you were in Russia, that the workers uh, put the did not. Uh, put together the shoes properly, they put the heel on top of the toe. <laughs> yeah, they were telling us that no one cared whether there they did go. a good job or not because they were paid very little whether the shoe fit, but they said that they that what their shoes would come out of the factory with a heel on top. Yeah, that's and, what I mean. Yeah. That's because what I the mean. workers the, Yeah, but the workers take no pride in what they do. And not only that, but the state chooses the job that you were employed at. Everything that happens in their lives, the state wills it. The state does it. And that's why Christianity cannot be taught freely there because it is what Donnie said, that person has got to make that decision for themselves on whether they will serve the Lord or not. And it was really, you could feel the oppression in the air. Well, there's yeah, no... And, and Go ahead. Where there's no critical thinking, there will be no challenge to the status quo because everybody will be dumbed down, blind, and they just go with what's been oh, crammed in their head. And, uh, uh, but you know, this really is not as new as you think, Mother, because I can remember back in the 70s, when I was in school, there were a little bit of this coming in. Yes, it was. And I used to get in trouble. I never told you, I used to get in trouble a lot because I would challenge that. I would challenge them. No, wait a minute. No. Uh -huh. I remember one of my history classes, what they were teaching was just wrong. Uh -huh. It was just wrong. And, and I would say, that's not right. That's not right. No, it did not happen that way. And I would go home and get my books, you know, not textbooks, but, well, you know, I've always been a reader, but all my, and I'd bring them back, lay them on the desk and say, read for yourself, different authors coming from different perspectives. What you're teaching is not right. Boy, I, Needless but to... that was that's what they were trying to do away with, and they have been successful in that to a large extent. But uh, I was looked at as a troublemaker because nobody else was saying anything. Mm -hmm. But I, no, I didn't challenge everything that was said. But when I saw something or heard something that was egregious and totally wrong, I would argue the point. And, it, you know, it, it, it did not make the teacher like me at all. No, no but, but if we don't stand up for what's right then you fall for anything, just exactly like you're speaking of, and that is the communist model of education, is to take control early so you can maintain control of those individuals right. throughout their life, and they are not going to find their purpose. They're not going to even look right. for their purpose or use their special gifts. That's exactly right. I want you to tell our, our listeners, Holly, we're talking about, uh, you know, you personally take control of what you listen to, what you read, 
what you uh, what you're involved in. But think uh, if you you were in Russia, they would be looking at your grades in school and decide, hey, you're going to go in this direction, and they would tell you you're going to be a doctor, or you're going to be a factory worker, or you're going to be a housekeeper, whatever they decided that you uh, should be, uh, that's what they would, you have to do that. You don't have a choice. In other words, Mike. You know, in, in the 70s, uh, uh, I have a family in, in Quebec, and uh, my, my cousins, uh, my one cousin wanted to be a, a brain surgeon. She had the grades and everything. But uh, the province told her, no, we have too many people going in that direction. We need you to be a general practitioner. And uh, so in Quebec, they were deciding uh, at the level of high school, as you're going into college, as to what you're going to be. Mm -hmm. And so they directed. And, and the idea there, I think, was the fact that uh, to make uh, the province strong, they were going to decide. But what do you do if your classes were determined by the weakest person in the class. What do you do with uh, those who have, uh, I, know, I know kids that, that my goodness, uh, at a very, very young age, they can do difficult arithmetic and, and, and they really want to excel. Uh, uh, we have, my, my, one of my keyboard players was the youngest graduate of LSU in the history of LSU, graduating at 16 years old. What would have done, what would have happened if he was put in a class where they didn't have that incentive to learn? Uh, he would be just right. working someplace that the and state pursue, decides. And, and pursue his, his desire right. for what he wants to do in life. That, that's all. So let me ask you this, Holly. Uh, all, it's a lot of other things that's happening in the schools today that plays into what we're talking about. Uh, and don't you think the sex re re revolution that we've had going on here in the United States of America, that that's playing right into this indoctrination of communism? Absolutely. And this, this has been the, the goal when you, as Mike pointed out, the goal is to change the cultural, change the religious, change the economic, change the political structure, change our government system, in other words. The goal is revolution. And what the environmental movement has done is twisted and stretched anything that, mm -hmm. to the point of, as I said, social justice, stretched environmentalism into changing every aspect of our lives. And what you're talking about, not only the, the entire transgender sexual revolution, that was part of Green Party ideology back in 1989, I believe, that was one of their goals in education, uh, along with ecological wisdom and a sustainable lifestyle. That was in 89. Where are we right now? The environmental movement has shifted the purpose and the focus of public education away from teaching basic skills to all political activism in these different areas. Students are being forced and pressured, basically, through peer pressure, to become vegetarians, to uh, reduce their footprint, to go out and be protesters. And if they don't, I've talked to many high school students that have come up to me after a presentation and said, if we don't go along, we're going to get a bad grade. And mm -hmm. if I get a bad grade in high school, I can't get into college. So it's basically, it's a blackmail process. Yes. Holly, let me ask this question. How, and of course, I'm sure you know about it. We've been reading about it, about this little child in kindergarten. And they bring up, brought out the book, I Am Jazz. And it was concerning transgenderism. And if you didn't feel like that you wanted to be a little boy, you could be a little girl. Or if you didn't want to, to want to be a little girl, then you could be a little boy. And it tells about the child that comes home crying, so upset, because she was afraid that she was going to be turned into a boy if she continued. I mean, she's just very afraid. How do these type of books get into the school? This, this is the push. It goes right back again to change, change, change. And the idea is, again, we're all going to be fair. But it has nothing to do with being fair. It has something to do with, uh, only to do with politically indoctrinating the children and changing. For example, with that book, it's changing the child's values is the ultimate goal. 
and forcing them by pressuring them, manipulating them to either pretend to adopt green values or adopt green values for real. And what you're talking about right there is a, a child who does not have the frame of reference to, to even possibly understand the whole transgender issue is wondering what's going to happen to them. And that's putting a, an unfair weight, a Amen. mature weight on a child's shoulders. We don't ask a child to drive a car or do brain surgery. Why would this be acceptable? It isn't acceptable, but it has been pushed, pushed, pushed gradually into the schools. There's, a, there's another aspect of this that goes right hand in glove with what you're talking about. Uh, MIT recently published a book right in, in concert with Earth Day, no surprise, uh, called Communism for Kids. MIT. Wow. produced a book, published a book, Communism for Kids. And mm -hmm. I would not suggest anybody go get it because that will promote and right. uh, fund this movement. But the only reason MIT would produce, publish, sell Communism for Kids, a little child story about how wonderful communism is, is because that's the target. Teach our children to adopt communism in and out of the classroom. And the problem is, again, Communism, the idea of everybody being fair, everybody's going to be taken care of, the idea is to use that emotion to diminish the value of individuality, diminish the value of success, and not mention how many thousands of people were killed under a communist dictatorship which ruled without God's wisdom. Okay, I'm, I'm, did I interrupt you? No. Okay. I, I was reading the little article that you sent me actually from World Net Daily that you had written entitled Opening the School Door to Communism. Well, that door has already been open and class schools are in some areas are already teaching communism and they have been for a number of years and it's even uh, becoming more and more noticeable now to parents that first were not aware of what was happening. And you think, Holly, that this is because of the implementation of, of the, uh, um, what did, oh, it just slipped my mind. The Education for Sustainability Agenda? The core. Yeah, core. Core, core. Yeah. core. I've got it now. The implementation of core. It, well, I believe Common Core uh, the it, it, I think the date I'm not sure of the date on that particular World Net Daily article that was an earlier article warning about what was coming I'm not mm -hmm. sure of the date but it was, it was okay what? actually it was in um, June of 2016 that you you wrote this and it's basically just talking about what we are discussing here today and you know where you they want to eliminate the gold of this type of ed education is to eliminate um, uh, the uh, the uh, eliminate private ownership of property mm. or right. capital. Right. Well, yeah, and actually, it's a social order that is being instituted and taught in the schools today. That's right. Not That's about right. education. No, not absolutely. about learning. Not how to uh, uh, be a good citizen, none of those things, but it's how to be a good communist, really. And That's it's really coming it. through. Okay, these social programs that are in the school. Um, and you have a, a thing here that's um, you highlighted concerning social justice includes a vision of society in which the distribution of resources is equal or equitable. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so that would make sense, what I heard the other night concerning teaching in the classroom. You know, it's got to include the lowest uh, IQ of the student in the room. And then, then they can't go any higher than that because you got to make all the children in the classroom feel equal. And so that's what we call the dumbing down process of students. And, the exactly right. and under communism, communism then decides right. to train that person in what they want them to do instead okay. of having them the ability to choose what field they want to be in. Would I be correct, Holly, to say that also the schools are teaching the, the kids to become activists? 
Oh, absolutely. The idea, and it goes right with what you just said, the idea is to take the classroom and use it as a model for future society. In other words, if everything's equal in the classroom and everybody operates in group think in the classroom, then when they leave the classroom, they'll be able and ready to operate the same way. Right, is that what we're looking at right now on television when we see all these hooded young people, their faces covered with baseball bats out there breaking and 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 tearing up things and what what is the name of that in um, Antifa? That, yeah, that is that where that comes from? The the teaching of students to be for communism has to have an outcome of teaching students to be against our form of government. And in fact, in one of the recent articles about Antifa that just came out uh, on uh, yesterday, actually, the 30th of August, at the Berkeley rally in Berkeley, California, was no Trump, no wall, no USA at all. No Trump, no wall, no USA wow. at all. And so these, this is why it's so important to understand that when you teach social justice in the classroom, you're teaching children to be activists for social justice. You have eighth graders marching in the street, marching to City Hall, you know, asking City Hall to take action on climate change. That should not be part of the curriculum. That is brainwashing. That is political indoctrination. It is telling the children what to think, telling them how to respond to an issue, and it is indoctrination, pure and simple. And when you're pushing the idea that we need to live in a completely equitable society in the classroom, you cannot help but also be teaching students to be against our form of government. Here comes the change, change, change that you pointed out, Mike. You right. change the religion. You change yes. the political system. You change the economic system because it's not fair. You're instilling hatred, not right. responsible behavior. And, and you, move, you move Christianity out of the classroom, out of society altogether, because both cannot sustain itself in the same environment. Now, listen to what we're talking about here. You know, God, Christianity, a love from the Lord, seeking the Lord's guidance, uh, preachers preaching sermons, and I will go a step further. Holly, you're probably not gonna make this decision, but if we had not have had Donald Trump elected, we would be right in the middle of that right now. You know, we had, in this generation, uh, going the last uh, the last 10, 15 years, we had the growth of the emergent church that states very clearly that Jesus Christ must be reinvented every generation. And that generation then decides what Jesus Christ, who he is, yeah. and his attributes, and it's all done by consensus. You've got the secret sensitive that says, listen, let's not say anything that can offend the people. Let's not talk about sin. Let's not, talk, let's not have altar calls for them to accept the grace that God is offering them to have their sins washed away. And we're seeing pastors that are being told, you don't have to preach from the Bible. You can go ahead and just preach a social message uh, because that's what the people hear. And what's happening is we're going further and further away from God. And America has to turn back to its scriptural roots that are found in God. All right, okay. go ahead. Holly, are you familiar with a book entitled The Keys of This Blood by Malachi Martin? Have you read, read in any of it? The, the, can you repeat the title again? Keys of This Blood is written by Malachi Martin. Uh, let me just read no. a few lines from it. It was, it was copyrighted in 1990. I've read this before in the past on Francis and Friends. And I'm just going to read a few lines. Our way okay. of, of life as individuals and as citizens of the nations our families, our jobs, our trades and commerce, our money, our education system, our religion, uh, and our culture, even the badge of our national identity, which most have, of us have always taken for granted, uh, all will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. No one can may be exempt from this effect. No sector of our lives will remain untouched. That's just a few lines from the introduction to that book. 19, and in 1990. Mm -hmm. And that's where, uh, that was the early 90s when I first wrote Set Up and Sold Out because the planning of this was much more visible 
now it's been buried. And I think it's just back to your one of your questions, it goes right with what you're talking about, Jim, that when you're talking about the core, Common Core, mm -hmm. Common Core was a vehicle to push it to, to nationalize the curriculum. It's a vehicle to nationalize the curriculum. What the focus right now is how Common Core is being used by the environmental movement, which is a political movement, and I can't stress that enough. It's not about the environment. It is a political movement that is taking over our schools as the means to change the future course of our nation and turn it to a communist nation. That's the whole point of indoctrinating generation after class of voters, new voters coming forward. That's why teaching them to be activists. So what you're talking about, Jim, can come to pass. The idea is to teach the children, so go the children, so go the nation. Stalin knew it, Lenin knew it, Castro knew it, Hitler knew it. So this movement is simply copycatting the idea of indoctrinating the children, dumbing down the children, using any means possible, but the environmental education piece is the primary piece that has been in play, which is now changing the complete focus of education to this to align students to all think the same, to align with this political philosophy. That is why it is so dangerous, and that is why it is a issue of national security. And we can all do something. We all know someone. We can all share information with our families. We can turn this around, and we must, because we're on this timeline where the idea right now with the Earth Day Network is to produce nothing but green voters. In other words, green voters prepared to impose communism uh, in the United States. The next three years are the target point. Graduate class after class nationwide. So in the 20, uh, by the time we're in the 2020 time frame, they have achieved a huge voting block of dictating how our future voters, our young people will think and will vote. But let's not leave out the church and pastors preaching the gospel and keeping the family in line because when it schools, I, I know what you're saying, but but the family structure is what God instituted first and foremost in the and Garden of Eden. And if it, right. and as the family goes, so goes everything else. And that's that's right. But the, I know the school. What you're saying about the school system, but the church and the pastors are not preaching the gospel and teaching and, and warning and informing their congregations of what's going on. That's very and important, very it's important. It's very important because the children right now are completely vulnerable to this if there is not dinner table conversation, conversation morning, noon, and night within the family about what's going on and preparing their children, have the parents prepared to recognize it, and then they can help prepare their children to uh, basically, as you were mentioning, Donnie, you recognize what was going on and you spoke up. Now, at least if the students recognize what's going on, yeah, they can Yeah, I'm going to take up. a quick break. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and we'll pick it back up right after the break. And at this time, you may call in and ask questions. We want the questions to stay on the topic that we are discussing today. And you can speak with Holly directly if you would like to. And that number is 800-342-8430. We'll be right back. Truth. Sometimes it's hard to find. That's why there's Francis and Friends. To order product from today's guest, Holly Swanson, call 1-877-715-5481. That's 877-715-5481. Or go to Amazon.com. Experience the difference. The Sun Life Broadcasting Network. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pastor Gabriel Swaggart. And if I were you, as a believer, I would have personally in my library as many books as possible that helps me to better understand the Word of God. And we have a plethora of material regarding how that you can better understand the Word of God and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got two books written by my grandfather who is, in my opinion, one of the greatest writers around. And of course, that is just my opinion. But he's got two books that we would like to present to you half off, half off. The first one 
the world, the flesh, and the devil. A term that the early church fathers coined many years ago. This will be a blessing and a rape of a nation. Both of these, half off. You can see the number right there on the screen. Go online and get your copies of these two books immediately. Get ready, Woodbridge, Virginia. SBN presents Donnie Swagger Friday, October 6th in Woodbridge, Virginia at Hylton Memorial Chapel. Just an awesome move of the Holy Spirit. Honestly, um, we need it. If you're in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore areas, you'll want to be there October 6th. Tremendous anointing services. A blessing to me, my wife. Join Pastor Evangelist Donnie Swagger and Family Worship Center singers and musicians for a spirit-filled evening of praise and worship you'll never forget. Mucho blessing for my mucho Holy Spirit I enjoy. It's SBN Presents Donnie Swagger, Friday, October 6th at the Hylton Memorial Chapel, 14640 Potomac Mills Road in Woodbridge. All seats are free for SBN Presents Donnie Swagger in Woodbridge, Virginia. To find out more, visit DonnieSwagger.org. Only music anointed by the Holy Spirit will draw the human heart to Jesus. So show me the way. special collection of anointed songs on Show Me the Way to Calvary from Greg Coleman. I Feel the miracle working ministry of Jesus Christ from the music of Greg Coleman. Did you ever need a miracle when your heart was feeling pain? It Show Me the Way to Calvary from Greg Coleman. To order, call 1-800-288-8350 or shop for all Family Worship Center music online at sunlifetv.com. This is Brother Lauren Larson. Don't miss out on the opportunity of being a student at Jimmy Swaggart Bible College and Seminary. If you love the Lord and you desire to learn the Word of God, then JSBC is the perfect place for you. One of the most exciting things that you'll encounter at JSBC is the college chapel service. We like to call the chapel service the classroom of the Holy Spirit. Here, our dynamic worship team will lead you in anointed praise and worship. Our speakers will come along and inform you of the Word of God, and they are professors or guests that travel from all around the country to bless our students. We conclude our services with an altar call that is never, never in a hurry. So, call us today at 225-768-3890, get signed up, and get ready to experience the moving of the Holy Spirit in a JSBC chapel service all for yourself. Joy comes in the morning. A CD DVD combo of live music from Family Worship Center. We promise me there's gonna be joy. Joy comes in the morning, features Family Worship Center singers Martha Ward, Donna Carline, Randy Nips, Jill Swagger, and Evangelist Jimmy Swagger. And I know. Oh, yes, I Joy comes in the morning. More live music from Family Worship Center. Call 1-800-288-8350 or order online at jsm.org. Joy comes in the morning. Taking the message of the cross to the world. This is SBN. Previous Francis and Friends programs are available online at sunlifetv.com. All right, someone just sent me, Holly, 
uh, the book that I, you mentioned, the book of Communism from, for Kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just one sentence I want to read here. Um, it said, and of course, it is showing that capitalism is what is causing all the evils in the world today that we're having, capitalism. And it says, um, um, speaking of communism, it's only a remedy for the e evils caused by capitalism. Uh, and if you have a cough and fever, you take a pill for the cough, but you're going to still, and the cough goes away, but you still have the fever. fever. Communism is kind of like that. This is a book teaching communism to little kids here. I didn't realize that, and um, that this book was in the schools. But who has the authority to choose the books that are oh, what I was just going to say, I don't know if it's being used in schools. I know that MIT published it, uh, but I don't know if it's being used in the schools. But definitely, simply by MIT publishing such a thing, it is definitely advocating communism to young Americans. Well, boy, they start this at a young age, that little book called Jazz. You know, they're giving it to kindergartens and, you know, preschool children. And it's terrifying them. <clears throat> they, they were being, being given this, uh, being taught this in class without the parents knowing anything about it. Also, Holly, uh, along with that train of thought, it's also now to where even children as young as what I was discussing, preschoolers, um, and then they decide that they are a little boy, and when really they're they're a little girl, and they can go to their teacher and talk to her about wanting to be a boy or a girl wanting to uh, uh, or a boy wanting to be a girl, and that school can start giving them hormone treatments to feminize them or to masculinize them, to make them a little boy, a little girl, without the families knowing anything about it. They don't have to tell the parents. And I don't know in how many states that is, that is occurring, but even if it's in one state, it, it, is, it is, again, it's putting the weight of a, the world on a child who is That's not right. capable of doing this. And when it comes to environmental education, the same tactics are used. It is using the fear of the end of the world, and if you don't do this, you're not going to survive. Where is the hope? Where is the joy of childhood? It's in, in Set Up and Sold Out, I called it eco-child abuse. It is emotional blackmail. It doesn't belong in our schools. It's a political agenda, and not only is it emotionally and uh, psychologically unfair to the child to manipulate them in this way, again, teaching communism right. in the classroom to mold these children's minds, change their values to achieve one political end, which is to force them into communism, it is absolutely positively an issue of national security. So you're in your article here, Portland School Board bans books that express doubt about severity of climate crisis. Right. Okay. And then they're going to allow books, such as what we're discussing here today, to take their places. Is that correct? That is correct. The idea is to turn the school, preschool through high school, basically into an activism, a political activism mm -hmm. type of education. Right. And these and these books, you know, the idea uh, is even admittedly biased, but. It is taking anything out of the realm of education, back to what Donnie was talking about, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. If you ban any books that question the facts or the science of climate change, and there is a lot of information pointing to the fact that the alarmist about climate change is uh, way overdone, uh, uh, basically the alarmist about climate change, Al Gore and others, ha are misinformed. And therefore, we need a different look at this. But if you only teach one-sided, one-sided bias education, the environmental movement's view of climate, then you're not going to have critical thinking. You're just going to have little children scared to death into complying with this. And back to the email you received uh, regarding the communism for kids, the idea here 
is that you're going to teach these students that the root cause of the climate change is our free market, the quest for private profit, and basically our system of government, the use of fossil fuels. All these are the root cause. So, again, right back to social justice, if the root cause is the American way of life, our American government, our founding principles, then you have to do away with those, and the alternative is communism. Once we understand the environmental movement is a political movement, we can see how the curriculum has been politicized and what the outcome is, and it's not going to be critical thinkers uh, like Donnie who were able to see what was going on. That's what parents need to do, prepare their children, because the children and parents are sending their child into school not suspecting this indoctrination. And I know teachers are frustrated, beyond frustrated. You know, teachers teach really that. themselves don't understand this curriculum. Mm -hmm. They, yeah. they, they don't know what they're teaching. Uh, I'm going to pause right now, and I'm going to go to our first caller today, Nina in Virginia. And Nina, sure. welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a quick question or comment? I have both, Francis. I have a comment. First on that I Am Jazz book that you you, you, you mentioned. I Am Jazz is a, t is a TV program, and it takes, and it takes, uh, it takes, uh, it takes that child, that toddler from the time he was big enough to pick up something that they realized that, that this little boy should be a little girl. And the mother and the family and everyone has helped this child transition into being a boy with all the, the, uh, the shots and everything. Uh, now this child is um, getting ready for body surgery. So it is not only in the schools, I am dad, but it is also on TV. And, it, and, it, and it's like a positive thing that is happening for this child because they're really giving this child his wish to turn into a little girl. And this is one miserable, unhappy, depressing mm -hmm. child. Yeah. And like <clears throat> it is, uh, my, I live in Hampton, Virginia, and we have four large high schools here. Matter of fact, one of them is one of the oldest high schools in the United States. They have announced that they're turning these high schools into vocational high schools. And I was just wondering, with Holly, does Holly know anything about these vocational high schools and is this a part of the agenda? The, in, in response to that, it depends if it's tied directly to education for sustainability and environmental activism. A Turning the whole sky, high school into a vocational school is a bit concerning uh, because it's all about uh, jobs and work, and that should be a part of education, but what is the purpose? And it would be my question, what is the purpose given for changing the focus of the entire high school into vocational training? Do you, do you know that? It does not say that. The only thing that it did say about it, because uh, uh, really, I, I didn't really read it that thoroughly, but the idea, well, it did say that if a student was in there and then say that they wanted to be a chemist or whatever they wanted to be, and they decided in, in, in between they don't want to do that anymore. They would have the freedom to change that vocation into something else. And that is really all, all, all basically all I know about it. But when you come up with this subject, I was kind of curious whether this was part of an agenda. Now, I live in a very liberal state, a city, uh, that, and it doesn't surprise me that there aren't, you know, the what the agenda they have. And, and my question would be, it would seem logical, and panel, I love your input, but it would seem logical that if a child enters high school in ninth grade and goes through 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, that if they're learning basic skills to be right. able right. to graduate competent, why do they have to choose a vocation? If, they, if that is an option, why do they have to choose a vocation to where oh, I'm going to be a chemist, and oh, then I changed my mind. Why do they have to choose a vocation at such a young age? You know, when I, when I was in high school, our high school, uh, this is in Canada, our high school uh, had four shops. We had electrical, woodworking, uh, uh, welding, um, and automotive. And your first when you, and now, when I went to high school, we started from grade nine up, so nine to 12 was uh, was at school. And uh, first, year, first year, the first half of the year, you did all four. You did a little bit in each one of them. The second year, you chose two of them. 
the third year you chose one. And so you got to taste a little bit of what's going on. I know here in Louisiana, a couple of years ago, it was in the news, they were trying to encourage vocational schools for the purpose of those who knew they were not going to get high enough grades to go to uh, LSU or university colleges, things like that. And so I said, well, why not use that time in high school to train them so that when they're finished high school, they're already trained for a field. And I think that was the idea of a lot of these vocational schools. Nothing wrong with a vocational school, but I think the idea is to, uh, the, the, the idea that troubles me, putting that and with, with, with what Holly said earlier, uh, the dumbing down of the student, then forcing them into that when all along, if we would have given them the proper education and the encouragement and the challenges, sometimes it's good for you to feel bad that you got a bad grade in your test. It encourages you to study next time. Right. But if we would have done that, then that person may have been something else. Exactly. That's exactly, you put your finger right on it. That's exactly true because as you learn and you live, then things become clearer to you about what you do want to do. And there's nothing wrong with uh, having vocation as a part of it because there, there are students that have, you know, just they're just so talented in woodworking or automotive and that ends up being their vocation. But if that's the whole purpose of the high school, then it right in line with what you just said. It is almost saying don't bother to think about college. You're all going to need to just go out and be part of the workforce. If you choose that, that's fantastic. But what what is the making the whole focus is my question. I'm in complete agreement with you, Mike. Right, right. All right. Holly, what about charter schools? I'm having questions asked about charter schools. Well, there's there's two views on charter schools as as I've heard it. One is is a wonderful opportunity to have competition in education where students can choose to go to another location, to whatever location they want to go to to get the type of quality education parents can choose to put their children in those schools. Um, And that's a wonderful opportunity, the choice. If you're not getting the education you need in a public school, you can go elsewhere. The other part of it is whether or not, and this is in some states, I don't know if it's in all states, I know I talk to uh, many people, and some charter schools are accountable for, uh, for how they spend the money, how they educate the kids. They're accountable to parents. That accountability question has come up before, and so that is the, the two things that I understand about charter schools. Accountability and two, number actually number one, that they're a great opportunity for parents to put their children where they feel comfortable their children are going to get a quality education. Okay, um, and uh, Nina, I hope that she, Holly's answered your question. Yes, you have. And Francis, if I hear any more or any more details about it, I'll email you with it, all right? All right, thank you. All let's right. go you to Sarah. That, yeah, let's go to Sarah. Sarah. I'm sorry, I think I cut someone off, but let's go to Sarah in New York. Sarah, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. Hi. 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 This is very exciting for me. (laughs) I've never called in. Um, I'm a born-again believer, (laughs) Um, and I have a question for Holly. Um, Holly, I'm a teacher up here in upstate New York. Uh, I teach children... um, I teach students who have disabilities in reading and writing. Mm-hmm. This year I'm working uh, with fifth and sixth grade students. Um, I have blessing of going back to the school where my mother, <laughs> and my mother was a Christian as well. Um, I would like to know, uh, like, with Donald Trump, Trump's um, presidency, do you see Common Core eventually being taken away. <laughs> I'm teaching Common Core reading program right now. Uh-huh. And I, I just wondered what... <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, in answer to your question, I know uh, President Trump is not for Common Core, but the executive order he just signed basically says the decision on teaching Common Core is up to the states and local schools. So right now, I think the jury is out whether or not Common Core has benefits or harmful. There's a lot on the harmful side, some on the benefit side. So I know, as I said, he is not for Common Core, at least he has stated that, and now it's up to the state. 
Right. The only thing I feel about Common Core, and I've been teaching the Common Core curriculum, we had a different reading program. We had a, what was called Houghton Mifflin, and that was a really good program. Um, the Common Core is a little more rigorous for the reading program, and it, it's the teachers are being, you know, the, the class, I'm not a classroom teacher, but I have to follow the t classroom teacher's curriculum, of course, to support these children so they become better readers, and I like I like it, but it is very rigorous. And um, by rigorous, I mean uh, a lot has covered in a week, and then the children are tested on that. Then the teachers have to teach another lesson the next week, and it's very it's very rigorous. Um, we have this, we, of course we have the state testing. A lot of weight is put on that state test, and I don't believe that the state test is a true uh, value of what that child is capable of. Because I see the children in my room who are struggling, and I see their potential. Do you know what I mean? I see the things they're doing that are just amazing to me. And then they go to take the test, and they don't pass it. You see what I mean? Absolutely. Because it is so, it is so intense. And, um, but that, it was kind of like that when we had our other reading program, too. And it's just, you know, of course, I, I work with a select group of children who, who struggle. But my goal with them is so that they, that they don't struggle. You know, and I, and I'm so, I'm so thankful that I'm a Christian. Because I, I can see, I see into their eyes, I see into their faces, and I know that they have potential. That's right, and that's that's what you are fostering, and that's what should be fostered in all children for them to be able to reach their potential and not be pigeonholed, be it by a test or any other means, to fit into the little box right now that this political movement has designed for them, and it depends on the content of what that rigorous reading is. I know that Common Core, uh, basically any Common Core subject or any subject can be used to introduce an education for a sustainability subject or a social justice issue as part of reading. This is a lot of the idea behind use Common Core to advance this nationwide. So we have to be very watchful of what the students are reading and that's why it's so important uh, I know my grandmother uh, stopped going to school when she was in eighth grade because she had to because of family situation. But she'd already learned the basics by then to where she was fine throughout the rest of her life. And right now, if, if our children aren't learning those basic skills and they're all over the board with other things, they're not going to develop the potential you're speaking of. I would like to talk about, well, I just want to make a comment about critical thinking and let me know if I have to go because I, I, I have to go to school and um, unpack my room um, today, but I just, critical thinking is something that we are, have been taught out of college up here at SUNY Potsdam to, to, do, to implement in our class. So I want to let you know that we are using critical thinking up here in upstate New York and um, I and the, the fact about the group, and you talked about the groups and all, well, one of the things that we try to, we try to teach the children is that when they get in a group, we have, to, we have to kind of form a community in our classroom. You know, we want the children to be comfortable with each other talking about a topic. So group thinking, I have a, I think group thinking is valuable in a sense in the classroom. Um, not if, not can I ask a question, uh, Ms. Sarah, can someone have a, an opposing point of view in your classroom? Yes, exactly. Okay. I, always, I always promote that. And I just wanted to shed some light on the topic and let you know that we are taught that at our workshop. We are taught that. Um, I feel very blessed because the things that we are taught in our workshop go along with what you're talking about. I just wanted to let you know that, and I do enjoy your program very much. And, and on the topic of education, I'm always loving to talk about that. 
But and the court could light on the topic and have you believe that we are doing what you're talking about up here in upstate New York. Meaning, okay, my question is, when you, just to clarify that, in other words, are you seeing the implementation of a political agenda in upstate New York? Is that what you're saying when you're doing that? This is what you're being taught in your workshop, what we're talking about? I don't, but I personally don't see it as that, Holly. I see it as training to help me become a better teacher to promote the critical thinking in my classroom, to promote the child to think on their own. And of course, I teach reading, and that's not a math topic. I don't know what my other colleagues feel about it, but I don't see it as political. I'm trying really hard to understand what you're talking about. And that is what I was going to say, pardon me for interrupting you, but that is exactly why I'm here talking about this, because it's so important. What has been presented as a new way of teaching, some of it's good, but it's critical to make distinctions between the political outcome and what seems like a good idea right now. When you're talking about building community in the classroom, an important distinction is what is the long-term outcome of that? If you look at where the environmental movement is coming from, the long-term outcome of building community in the classroom is so the students go through their entire school. You're talking about teaching fifth and sixth grade students, and believe me, I am empathizing with what you're saying. The outcome, if this goes through all schools, is the students come out with a community mindset and not in the terms that we would normally think of community responsibility, civic duty. They come out with a mindset of this is the way a community should function, and that's where the political comes in. The idea of how a community should function is everybody's equal, everybody does this, this, and this. And all I'm saying is the distinctions are critical when it comes to individual thinking, individual liberty, free thought, individual values. And if the values are all geared to how students should behave as they grow up, then it is an indoctrination process. And that's why it's so important for teachers to understand teachers are being targeted, education is being targeted, just like the students are being targeted. And you sound like a very passionate person, and that's why it's so important, like you say, when you go to these workshops, this is what you're being taught. And the question should be, really, my suggestion would be to question and critically think about everything those workshops are teaching and does it go along with social justice. Do those workshops play into teaching communism in the classroom? That's the question that I think would be very important to answer. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Understand. Yeah, Sarah, could you and Holly stay on the line? I've got to go to another quick break, and we'll be right back after the break, continuing with this conversation. Find out more about Francis and Friends on our website, francisandfriends.com. product from today's guest, Holly Swanson. Call 1-877-715-5481. That's 877-715-5481. Or go to Amazon.com. As most of you know, Mike Muzzerol is on Francis' program quite often. And we consider Mike to be one of the most noted authorities in the world today on the cults. These are directions, religious directions that are false. I've got in my hand three DVDs. This one is The Truth About Mormonism. You need to know what this particular religion teaches as a child of God. You need to understand it. You need to know it. I think Mike will go into detail to help you understand this as maybe you have not before. This one is a must, ladies and gentlemen. The truth about Islam. The truth about Islam. And he deals with it in a clinical way to help you to understand the falsity of that particular religion. 
and then the truth about Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness. And you need to know what that is also. One of the great problems with many, many believers is that they just don't have the knowledge they ought to have of the Word of God to know when something is wrong. You need this. You need to take advantage of it. Now listen carefully to me. We're cutting the price because I want you to have them. You need them. You need to know what the Bible says about these particular things. And considering that we've cut the price to the bone down to $10 each, I would pray that you would take full advantage. That would be $30 for all three of these. Now, this is Jimmy Swaggart saying, get out your credit card or your debit card and go to that phone right now and place your order. I'll promise you this, you won't be disappointed. When looking for a great school in Baton Rouge, we'd like you to consider Family Christian Academy. Family Christian Academy does not believe in a one-size-fits-all approach to education. Tuition costs are very competitive. Common Core standards do not apply to private Christian schools. FCA uses the Ipeca curriculum for K-4 through 5th grade and state-approved standards for middle and high school. Discover Family Christian Academy. Call 225-768-3026 or visit fcacademy.net. Experience the difference. The Sun Life Broadcasting Network. We're tackling issues affecting the modern church. If you have a suggestion for a future program, send it to onair at jsm.org. Okay, we're back, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we have Sarah from New York on the phone with Holly Swanson. And we're going back into that discussion. Uh, Sarah, did you, uh, have you been satisfied with what Holly has said or do you have more that you'd like to ask her or, or maybe challenge what you've heard here today? Uh, no, I, I don't, um, Sister Francis. I, I, I agree with what she's saying. Um, I would like to say that I could use your prayers over the next year. <laughs> sure. Um, I um I do the best I can with what I'm teaching and I try to I don't try I allow each student in my classroom to be an individual and to teach Christian values although I can't teach Christianity because I'm in a public school right, right. but I, I but in my in my classroom I I I teach Oh, I was, I was brought up in a Christian home. My father and mother were both, I was brought up in a Catholic home. Yeah, let me ask um, you a question, Sarah. Uh, do you teach Islam in, in your classroom? Or do you know teachers that do? No. You don't? No. Well, thank the Lord for that. Okay. May, may, I, may I ask a quick question, just, Sarah? It, when you're talking about the workshops that you go to, and, you know, as you're talking about critical thinking, thinking about where those workshops come from, who's teaching them, and uh, to evaluate when you're talking about a community classroom, is social justice the focus? And if social justice is the focus, understanding the definition of social justice would help uh, immensely because then as you see curriculum coming down the pike, you can make distinctions, and it's also so very important understanding where your heart is, is to understand the goal of this movement is to change the religious values of this nation, to basically eliminate the Christian belief system and change values slowly and teach humanism. So if you understand the agenda of this movement, it would help, I believe, it would help you as you go through these workshops to maybe uh, yeah. just evaluate them differently. Right, evaluate them differently. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, like I said, my mother was a teacher for uh, 34 years in, in the same school I, they took me back to, and she taught fifth grade. Um, so it's just, I don't know, you just have to, 
you have to be, like you said, a critical thinker in education. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that education, the goal is to change the focus of education as the means to change all the pieces of our society as the means to graduate new voters who will vote to impose communism. That's the baseline goal. And so many wonderful teachers have been caught in the crosshairs, caught in the middle, because the it has been so well disguised as nonpartisan curriculum when it's absolutely just like the social justice curriculum. It is absolutely partisan. It is absolutely to achieve control over those students' lives and over the teachers for that matter. Uh, yeah, and, and Sarah, listen, we will be in prayer for you, uh, yes. most definitely, and I'd like to hear from you often during the school year to see if any of this, you see it creeping in. We'd love to hear from you on that. Thank you all very much, and have a great bus day. Thank you so much. You and I want to read this, and I'd like for Sarah and as well as Holly this email just came in, and then I'm going, after I read the email, we're going to Eddie in West Virginia. But it says, um, in and of itself, it's not bad to teach young people to be active in trying to improve their surroundings. The main question is the content of the training. Christians do this also. My dad was a conservative educational professor who is and was a Christian. And he taught us as children to be critical thinkers. In my view, the best way to improve things at your local school is to be a positive presence there and with good solid information and materials when needed, challenge the common core and the sustainability doctrines on pure logic and reasoning. Many Christians in our local schools have been able to reduce the impact of the goofy stuff that is taught. Um, just calmly and sensibly, uh, matter-of-factly, friendly way, question some of these doctrines with good facts to support it. My, call, my coach used to call me a communist. The word as a broad brush has lost some of its meaning. Better to challenge the less leftist ideas one by one with common sense. So how does that sound to you, Holly? I agree completely with the idea of approaching it in a responsible and reasonable manner. Absolutely. We have to respect the rights of others. And however, we are dealing right now with a communist political movement. We right. don't need to call these students communists. We need to love these students. We need to understand the students in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. We need to let them heal. However, when you're dealing with a communist movement that is targeting every school, preschool through university level in the United States to take over education, and it's a well thought out, well implemented plan, and it is a plan, we need to call it what it is. Otherwise, we miss the point. And if we challenge it one at a time, that is that is an effective strategy. But right now, we're losing American children to this movement. We don't have time or the luxury of challenging one issue at a time. We need to understand our children are being targeted. Our children are being trained to adopt the communist agenda. We need to realize it is a national security issue and calmly and reasonably and respectively approach it from that standpoint. We, it, it's, a, it's a national indoctrination plan and addressing it on the local level and the state level will be helpful, but it's a national security issue. Right. All right. Uh, thank you, Holly. And we're going to Eddie in West Virginia. Eddie, you have a quick question or comment for Holly? I do. Praise the Lord. And we just are so appreciative to have you all helping us to be educated on these points. And my question is addressed to Miss Holly that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, we hear uh, so much about it being the environmental movement and that it's basically communism. We know safe the author behind it, but uh, we never hear specifics as to 
of names. The only name I've ever heard in regard to it is uh, Al Gore. Uh, how does so somebody get so entrenched in our environment, our society, our schools, our government, etc., and nobody be able to uh, be held accountable for it? And that's oh, very frustrating and very troubling to me. I would like to know names so that we can combat it somehow. If they're in office, vote them out. If there are uh, other forms of uh, our, our environment, uh, do whatever we can to combat it. It's like fighting a shadow boxy, you know, or a shadow government. That's right. You, you are exactly right. It is not a boogeyman that cannot be seen or identified. And that is why in Training for Treason, as well as Set Up and Sold Out, Training for Treason specifically about what's going on in education, not only names names, uh, Senator John Kerry, Anthony Cortese, Al Gore, Mikhail Gorbachev, and more. Naming names is critical also in the back of the book of Training for Treason. Uh, and just a little bit of background. Mikhail Gorbachev is the architect. His pet project is called the Earth Charter. The Earth Charter is a document which Mikhail Gorbachev wants to see adopted as international law. The Earth Charter is filled with Green Party ideology, which mirrors communism. It's filled with the same ideas. And this Earth Charter has been endorsed by every major environmental group, and including uh, Second Nature, which is John Kerry's organization, the Earth Day Network. And what's important about this is in the back of the book, there is page after page after page, state by state by state, identifying the organizations in every state which have signed on to the Earth Charter. And it gives people an opportunity to not only understand what environmental groups are supporting the Earth Charter and the implementation of this treasonous document and treasonous political ideology, but it gives people an opportunity to reasonably, responsibly, respectfully talk to those organizations. And if they do not know they are endorsing a communist agenda, they can read the book Training for Treason, understand it, and they can remove their endorsement from the Earth Charter. And that's one way to reduce the power of this movement. But the most important thing we need to do is understand that it is a communist movement. And when you read Training for Treason, you can see the alignment of the environmental movement directly with the goals of the Green Party and Green Party goals mirror communism. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, one quick follow-up. Um, okay. We're... We're retired, my wife and I, and we get these political mailings every day, Mark. Our mailbox is just loaded with them. And at least once uh, every couple days, we get one uh, soliciting donations for being anti-common uh, core. But it, it always has watching the dress on it, and I don't trust it for anything. Am I, am I discerning the spirit there? I would think so. I, I would. I would trust your. I would trust what you're talking about. If you don't have a return address, who is sending this to you? It's Washington D.C. or is the return address. It's so, you know. It's always some freedom in their name, but uh, I've never heard of them. You know. Well, the only the only thing that you can do. I mean, we receive uh, things like that all the time. If it is a credible organization, you can look it up online or pick up the phone 